On this edition of College Press Box, number one Texas football jumps to four and oh heading into SEC play. The MLB playoffs are just around the corner, and the NFL is in full swing at the conclusion of week three. All this and more on College Press Box. Good evening and welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Kenna Unger and he's Henry Hipsman. What a weekend for Longhorn Sports, but before we dive into the show, we want to share with you that College Press Box is brought to you by Cat Metro, Austin's transit system. We connect you to work, school, play, and everywhere in between. Plan your ride to this weekend's game at catmetro.org. Texas had yet another action-packed Saturday of football, dominating ULM and scoring 50-plus points for the third time in four games. Let's take a look at some of the game's best moments. Here we have Arch Manning, he's been known for his deep ball a couple times this year, drops back, steps up, throws, looks for his number one wide receiver, Isaiah Bond, gets in near the end zone. An amazing catch by Isaiah Bond, who's been having himself an impressive year so far. Then we're going to jump over to Jaden Blue. Jaden Blue had himself a heck of a game, run to the right side, run to the right side, trying to set up the one-yard rush where he's going to power through a couple Warhawks pushing, pushing, and he's in the end zone. Another a touchdown for Jaden Blue, his first of three for the day. And then we're going to cut to Anthony Hill reading the pass. He's going to make the catch, make his way towards the end zone, get near the one-yard line. Did he get in? He was ruled not in, but still an amazing catch, setting up Texas for yet another touchdown on the day. And Jaden Blue, for the third time, is going to go. Go push through some Warhawks once again, and yes, another touchdown. Three touchdowns on the night for our starting running back. And Texas football dominating against ULM this past Saturday. Robert Gonsolin had the opportunity to cover this past weekend's final non-conference game at DKR. Here's his perspective of this past Saturday's rowdy night game. In their first matchup after being ranked number one in the AP poll last Sunday, Texas football was back in DKR again for a non-conference bout with ULM. Facing some injury problems, the Longhorns were without key players Quinn Ewers and Quintragon Wisner. Well, one player who was back on the field, however, was star running back Jaden Blue, and he stole the show. Leading up to Texas's final non-conference game Saturday night, it was still a mystery whether starting running back Jaden Blue would make his return from an ankle injury he suffered against Michigan two weeks before. However, on the first drive of the game, it was clear the Houston native was back after he took all the handoffs every time the ball was run. Midway through the first quarter, Texas put together their first scoring drive. Along with the help of a 56-yard pass from Arch Manning to Isaiah Bond, the Longhorns handed the ball off to Blue every play until he scored the game's first points by punching it in from the one-yard line. Blue then continued to show his healthiness on the field by scoring three more touchdowns, two on the ground and one in the air. While the run game proved dominant for the Longhorns, other Texas players also made their mark, including Arch Manning and Leona LaFowle, who finished with six tackles and a safety. Manning, who made his first career start at the collegiate level, connected with 11 different receivers and threw for over 250 yards. He talked about how having so many options to rely on can be helpful. I think just having so many playmakers around you, it's, it's definitely um, brings up the comfort level for me. Um, we got a bunch of different receivers catch balls tonight, so just um, getting them in space and having them make plays is, is huge. Tonight's score of 51-3 showcases just the third highest amount of points the Longhorns have scored in the game so far this season. But as non-conference play wraps up, a new era begins. Texas will be back in DKR next Saturday to play Mississippi State and begin SEC play, a time of the season where they'll face off against tougher opponents. That'll wrap things up here tonight in DKR, however. Reporting live for TSTV Sports, I'm Robert Gonsolin. Now joining
Jackson Berwick to fill us in on this past Saturday's game against the Warhawks. Jackson, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, my friend. And the first game with Arch at the helm was highly anticipated for Longhorn fans, and I think it lived up to the expectations. And he faced some early struggles, but the way he bounced back, it, it was a very good way that he bounced back. It was a really good sight to see, and it's always fun to watch those post-W fireworks. Arch Manning had his first start of his collegiate career. What do you like and not like about his performance? Well, there was a lot to like, but early on, one thing I did not like was the early interception on Arch's first drive. As you see, Arch faces some heavy pressure and actually does a great job extending this play by making a defender miss. However, in a panic, he makes a crucial mistake trying to force this ball into double coverage instead of throwing the ball away, ultimately turning the ball over after the horns were clicking on offense. However, let's get to the positives, which with a final score of 51-3, there were plenty of, one of which was the confidence that Horns play caller Coach Sark had after the early mistake. As the possession right after the INT, Sark draws up a shot play for Arch, and oh boy did he deliver as Arch throws a perfect rope from his own 25-yard line to inside the opposing 20 to none other than Mr. 007, Isaiah Bond. As you see on the sky cam, I mean, look at this thing. Wow, you're going to get a second angle here. I mean, look at this thing. He slings this one all the way downfield, and ultra impressive and for a quarterback in his first start to display this kind of resilience and confidence I mean it should have Texas fans not only excited for the future of this season but next season as well. Speaking of the future with Mississippi State coming up on the schedule and Quinn Ewers getting over his abdomen injury he is questionable to start. If he's available, do you think you should get the start or take more time to rest for bigger games? Well, it really is a toss-up, but let me be clear. If Quinn is good to go, he should get the start. It's Quinn's team, but siding with caution might be the best move for Texas as Mississippi State is currently second to last in the SEC, and they've been outscored 116-68 to in their last three games. But more importantly, Quinn has a history with the injury bug. As we've all seen in the past, what happens when Quinn has tried rushing back from an injury before, and with the Red River game being next on the calendar after Mississippi State and the bye, I would roll with Arch and give Quinn all the time he needs to rest up and be 100% for the first SEC duel against Oklahoma, as well as the fact that Arch, in his limited time as the Texas quarterback, has put up an incredible 576 passing yards, seven passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns, and only two picks. Texas officially kicks off against their first SEC opponent this week. What do you think they need to do to establish their dominance in their new conference? Well, in my opinion, there's two key factors for Texas to have success in this week's game, in their first game in the SEC, excuse me. The first key is maintaining their dominance in the trenches offensively. Jumping back to last week, Arch right here does a fantastic job moving up in the pocket, but left tackle Kelvin Bakes Jr. does an even better job keeping the pocket clean for Arch as he was able to deliver a strike to Wingo over the middle as well as the fact that Texas O-line has been clicking on all cylinders this year, and they've only given up three sacks, and Banks is a big part of that. And the second key for Texas is on the other side of the football. They need to continue to bring the heat from the front seven. And this play from last week perfectly encapsulates the kind of pressure and intensity that the defense needs to bring with them, as there was a plethora of burnt orange jerseys in the backfield forcing that safety. And you can see on your screen, one, two, three, four, five defenders getting in there forcing the safety. And really at the end of the day for Texas, as you get another look at it here, it's all about winning the battle on both trenches. Yes, it certainly is. Thank you so much, Jackson. When we return to College Press Box, the MLB playoff push has reached its peak. Grabiel Silver returns to give his perspective on who's in and possibly out. You don't want to miss it. We are one week away from October, and that means the MLB playoffs are almost here. College Press Box welcomes Grabiel Silver here tonight to tell us all about it. How are you doing tonight, Grabiel? I'm doing great. I'm excited for the end of another great MLB season and the start of arguably the best postseason in sports. Yeah, so let's start with the National League side. How have we gotten to the playoff picture we have now? The National League playoff race has been heating up lately. The Dodgers, Phillies, and Brewers have all clinched the playoff spot, with the Brewers already locking up the NL Central last week. It can be safe to assume that the Phillies will clinch the East sometime soon as well. The Dodgers, on the other hand, only have a three-game lead over the flaming hot San Diego Padres. Both teams are meeting up this week for a three-game series in Los Angeles, and it could have a massive impact on what the playoff picture will look like in October. The wild card race has dropped down to four teams. The Padres, Diamondbacks, Mets, and Braves are the four teams battling for the three wild card spots in the NL. The aforementioned Padres have been the best team in baseball 
since just after the All-Star break. They were 15-50 at the 100-game mark, but are currently looking at a 90-66 and record at the home stretch of the season. The Diamondbacks have also been a team that has caught fire after the All-Star break. They are currently the second wildcard team and are looking to hold on to it with games against the Giants and Padres to end the season. Now, the last wild card spot is currently held by the New York Mets, but just two games behind the Mets are the Atlanta Braves. The Braves have battled injuries all season long, like losing Spencer Strider and reigning MVP Ronald Acuna Jr. But they control their own destiny with a three-game series against the Mets and then finishing off against the Royals. The Mets have used the magic of Grimace and Jose Iglesias' OMG song to rally in the second half to chase down the Braves, who were 10 games ahead of the Mets at one point to be in position for the final wild card spot. The Mets have to go to Atlanta for a three-game set, like I mentioned earlier, and then finish off on the road against the Brewers. The National League has definitely had its ups and downs, but it's shaping up to be a gauntlet once the calendar flips to October. Okay, so now on to the American League. How have we gotten to the mayhem that will be decided in the next few days? Well, if you thought the National League race was hot, the American League has produced even more drama as we head into the final week of games. The Yankees and Guardians have already clinched a playoff spot, with the Guardians already clinching the Central Division and the Yankees looking to do the same soon in the East. The AL West leading Houston Astros are also looking to clinch the division, needing to, just, needing to win just one game in their series against the Mariners to clinch the division, something that didn't seem possible when the team started off 12 and 24 and were down as much as 10 games from the division race in June. But the wild card race is where the real drama is occurring. The Orioles have comfortably held the top wild card spot for most of the year, but have been very shaky as of late. The other two wild card spots currently belong to the Kansas City Royals and the Detroit Tigers, with the Twins and Mariners within two games of the last spot as well. The Royals have been one of the top stories in the league all year long. After losing 100 plus games a season ago, they now find themselves in a playoff spot. Yet, unfortunately for the Royals, they are currently on a seven game losing streak and their last two series are against the Nationals and the Braves. And the Royals could see themselves on the outside looking in even after a special season. Now the other surprising story in the league has been the Detroit Tigers. On August 11th, the Tigers had a 0.2% chance to make the playoffs. They have overcome an 11 game deficit and now that number has, is currently at 62%. They have had a 27 and 11 record since August 11th and had help from the Twins losing 21 of their last 32 games and the Royals going on their long losing streak. The Tigers are going to have to hold on to their wild card spot against the Rays and the White Sox, who are the worst team in modern history. And all those games are at home, so I expect Comerica Park to be rocking to end the season. The Twins have been on a downward spiral and are going against the Marlins and Orioles to end the season in hopes of rebounding to make the playoffs. The Mariners, who are up by as many as 10 games in the AL West, are going to need help in order to make the wild card. With all of that said, it is certainly going to make for an interesting final week in the AL wild card race. Okay, so after all that, when everything is said and done, what do you think the playoff picture will end up looking like, and what are your thoughts on how October could play out? Well, as we've seen in the last couple of years, October baseball is anything but straightforward. These last few days of the season will definitely be a wild ride for those who tune in. I believe that the final playoff picture for the NL will be the Dodgers, Phillies, Brewers, Padres, Diamondbacks, and Mets. I don't really see any changes with the current picture unless the Mets pull a low Mets and lose the final spot in the wild card race. As for prediction, I believe that the NL champion will be from the West, whether that's the Dodgers, the Padres, or the Diamondbacks. The Dodgers have the highest expectations with the roster they have built, but their pitching is a concern, and as we saw last season, their stars could go cold and the pitching can only do so much. I believe the Padres are the most dangerous wildcard team in the NL, and the winner of the NL pennant has been a wildcard team every year since it was expanded to three teams. And then the Diamondbacks, have the experience from last year to build off of. But overall, the NL is a bloodbath, and the team that gets through will be battle-tested and ready for whoever they face in the World Series. Now in the American League, it seems a little bit more of a softer group of teams. A lot of the playoff teams are hovering around 85 to 90 wins. I think that the final playoff picture will be the Yankees, Guardians, Orioles, Orioles, Royals, and Tigers in that order. I believe that the last two spots could flip-flop but I do not see the Twins rebounding after losing their lead, and the Mariners are just too far gone in my opinion. I believe that the road to the World Series will again have to go through Houston. The Astros have had a historic rebound, and they have a lot more experience compared to the other teams in the AL. The Orioles are still young, and they got swept last season. The Royals and Tigers are experiencing the big stage for the first time in many years. 
The Guardians always come up short in October. And the Yankees, well, they just have to hope they don't face Houston because they have not been able to get past them in October. The playoffs is almost here, and it's exciting to see how everything could possibly shape out. Thank you for that analysis, Gabriel. Up next on College Press Box, the young NFL season has already had an eventful start. Returning to the show, Zach Davis gives us a week three update. We'll be right back on College Press Box. Welcome back. The NFL season is underway, and we've already seen some action-packed play. Here to talk some of the biggest storylines is Zach Davis. How's it going, Zach? It's going well, Henry. Excited to talk NFL football. I am, too. Mel Kuyper went viral this week, passionately advocating for the elimination of two high safeties in order to promote deep pass plays. What do you think of this proposition, and would the NFL ever do it? You know what, Henry? I'm glad you brought it up. And honestly, I'm just going to get it right into it and say, no, Mel Kuyper, no. If you don't know what the too high safety is for the viewer, it is two players in the backfield, in the middle of the field, covering the left and right side behind the cornerbacks for additional help. Now, with that being said, the too high safety is modern, which means a lot of offenses simply have not adjusted to it yet. The coverage is weak when you play a team with good run schemes and solid O-line. Yes, quarterbacks so far this season are not garnering a lot of yards in the air, but their completions are still up as well as their completion percentage. The ball is just being thrown shorter and the exciting plays are becoming more rare. Offenses must adjust and the ones that do will be rewarded. We've already seen how the Chiefs, Bills and other high-powered offenses have had to evolve. It's not just about going deep anymore. I mean, we look into Patrick Mahomes, Henry. He went from having 9.1 yards of yards of throwing in 2018 to I believe it's now 5.1. Or in that mix, it's about mixing in the efficient run game, exploiting shorter routes, and protecting your QB long enough to create those deep shots when the opportunity arises. Defenses adjust, but so do great offenses. And remember, it's not like two high safeties are unbeatable. They're just part of the modern chess match. What we're seeing is a shift in the cat and mouse game between offensive play callers and defensive coordinators. As offenses catch up, we'll see more teams breaking through these schemes without needing drastic rule changes. So no Mel Kuyper. Don't outlaw two high safeties. Let offenses adjust and innovate. And, that, and, highlight, and the highlight plays you crave will return on their own. It's just the evolution of the game. This could be Tush Push Part 2. The debate goes on. Caleb Williams has recently played his third NFL game and has shown struggles. Do you think there is any need for panic from Bears fans? And what do the Bears need to do to best utilize the Heisman Trophy winner? Well, look, Henry, the former first overall pick is not off to the best start. That's no doubt. Two touchdowns, four picks with two losses, three games played. Not the best start. But I think struggling is a stretch. Just yesterday, Williams threw for 363 yards, which is a season high. And I'm not, not just Caleb Williams, but for all quarterbacks in the NFL. We saw Williams finally click with Roma Dunsey, who caught six balls for 112 yards and a touchdown. Let's not forget, the offensive line has been struggling to protect Williams, which is making it harder for him to get into a rhythm. But despite all of that, he's still showing flashes of the talent that made him a first overall pick. If he can cut down on the turnovers, get more consistent support from his offense, there's no doubt he'll turn things around. And I believe he will eventually silence the critics. I don't think we can blame everything on Caleb Williams just yet. I think you're right. It's three weeks since the NFL season, and we've seen some crazy plays from former Longhorns. What former Texas player has been your favorite to watch and why? Well, you know, as the Sark era ages, the talent of the NFL tree starts to show its Longhorn branches, Henry. I remember when I was a freshman at the Texas-Oklahoma game, the Cotton Bowl put on a graphic, showed all the different NFL players from both schools. And let me tell you, Texas's highlights were about 20 seconds long, and Oklahoma's was at least five minutes. It was a while. Um, from both offense and defense, I would like to highlight a couple guys. B. John Robinson, Xavier Worthy, DeMarvion Overshone, Jordan Whittington. They have all showed a lot of early 
promise, promise in their careers. Robinson, for starters, scored just last night against the Chiefs in prime time. 196 yards on the ground this season, 15th in the NFL. 48 carries, 11th in the NFL. Another guy that's been killing it in his first three games is Xavier Worthy. Rookie year, drafted in the first round. His debut game, Worthy found two scores against the Ravens. First night of the NFL, one being a 21-yard run, flashing a 4.21 40 time. Worthy is explosive, and it's nice to see his big playability on the big stage. Moving on to Marvion Overshone. Shout out Joe Duffy, starting at linebacker for the Cowboys, is in his rookie year after tearing his ACL in the preseason last year. In three games so far, Overshone has 21 tackles and a sack, but I don't think the stats even back up his own talent. Analysts have pointed out how quick he can get across the field. And his coverage ability is making opposing quarterbacks struggle. And opposing offensive coordinators change the focus to lean on the run game against the Cowboys. Overshone is showing early signs to being a key difference maker for his squadron. And the future is bright for the Texas X. And finally, my favorite Texas X, Jordan Whittington. Five years in Austin catching 141 throws for over 1,700 yards behind a couple different quarterbacks throwing to him. Now, after being drafted in the sixth round by the Rams, he's making a difference on the football team out of Los Angeles. Ever since Puka's gotten hurt, he's had signs of being able to get out there. Five catches, 50 yards, and the targets are only growing as the games go on. One can wait to see how Whittington will grow throughout this year. But the future is bright for the former five-year Longhorn. Whittington is looking like a steal in that draft. Much appreciated as always, Zach. When we return to College Press Box, Kendall briefs us on Texas soccer's opening SEC home contest against Alabama this past Thursday. And we also take a look at this past week in Longhorn Sports and look ahead at what is to come. Stay with us right here on College Press Box. Welcome back into College Press Box. Now let's take a quick look back at the past week in Longhorn Sports. Two Texas volleyball players, Reagan Rutherford and Madison Skinner, were named to the ABCA National Player of the Year watch list. The duo is recognized among 36 other players from 21 different Division I schools. Texas has inducted some notable names into the Hall of Honor this past week, including Kansas City wide receiver Marquise Goodwin, former All-American defensive end Alex Okafor, and Longhorn legend Colt McCoy. Texas Volleyball was back on home Friday night when they defeated Hawaii. The Longhorns are ranked number eight with a record of five and three. This past Thursday, Kendall had the opportunity to cover Texas soccer's SEC home opener against the Crimson Tide of Alabama with Perla Paredes. Absolutely, and what an experience it was. Texas soccer has been surging, and now let's see a look at what transpired. Here at Mike A. Myers Stadium, the Texas Longhorn soccer team goes up against Alabama. This is UT's first program to go up against an SEC component since joining the conference, and the Longhorns also look to keep their 13 home game win streak alive here. Just two minutes in, Texas freshman Amalia Villarreal scored the first ever goal for Texas in SEC play. Senior Jilly Shimkin then extended the lead to 2 to nothing, but Alabama responded with a powerful free kick to close out the first half. Both teams missed many opportunities to score by a couple weak shots and unclear contact, and there seemed to be lots of aggression on the field out there tonight. After a grueling 90 minutes of play with two yellow cards for each team, Texas ended the night with nine fouls and Alabama with 10. The first SEC matchup of the year for the Texas women's soccer team ends in a tie 2-2 two to two against the Alabama Crimson Tide. It seemed like the Longhorns had it in the bag, scoring the first two goals of the game. However, going into the half, the score was 2-1. to one. Coming into the second half, Texas was leading 2-1, to one, and in the last 10 minutes of play, the Alabama Crimson Tide was able to score a goal for the tie of a header from a corner. The Longhorns played their second SEC opponent yesterday away at Mississippi State where the final score was one to nothing. There is still a lot of game left to play for them and the Texas soccer team heads to Ole Miss on Thursday. Looking ahead to this week in Longhorn sports, also this week the Texas football team plays back at DKR on Saturday against their first SEC opponent Mississippi State. Both men and women's tennis compete in the ITA All-American Championships 
Plus, on Friday, women's track and field heads to Arkansas for the Chili Pepper Festival, and volleyball plays away at Texas A&M. On Sunday, volleyball's at LSU, and soccer is playing Texas A&M. That will wrap it up this week's edition of College Press Box. Make sure to tune in to our other shows this week, including College Crossfire Wednesdays airing at 9 p.m. and the 1-0 Sports Show on Friday, now at 11 a.m. Thank you to our analysts, everyone in Master Control, our executive producer, Joseph Duffy, and everyone else at TSTV. I'm Henry Hipschman. She's Kendall Unger. Thank you very much, and have a good night.